The first time Mark and I had a quiet Saturday morning interrupted by our postal carrier who had walked up to our front door speaking loudly through the screen door, not to us, but with someone on the other end of the earpiece of his Bluetooth headset, we looked at each other and snickered. Now we shake our heads in amazement because every single time he drops something into our mailbox, he's talking to someone on his headset. Every single time. It's as if he can't seem to shut up. And because of his incessant babbling, he inevitably misses the miracle of the morning and all that it holds. And if you walk into any grocery store, you'll see the same thing. It's as if it's filled with customers who are suffering from schizophrenia, animatedly talking to people no one else can see and responding to their hallucinations, all while scanning the shelves for the right brand of tomato sauce. Until you notice the earpiece and can breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't suffering from a mental illness after all. We are a sensory addicted people who avoid silence at all costs, may be afraid of what it might contain. We even look for God in sensory overloaded worship experiences. In the praise band that gets the audience revved up with its rendition of hot off the press top 10 contemporary Christian music. In the animated shouting preacher who has worked himself or herself into a lather, pacing back and forth across the stage, wiping sweat from their brow and demanding periodic affirmation from the audience. Even the person leading the congregation in community prayers is backed up with the keyboards to help make it an emotional experience for the people who are present. This is where many folks have come to expect an encounter with God in the lights and sound of the Sunday morning church experience. Meanwhile, there's another group of Christians who gather in silence. One person describes it this way. This gathered worship, as Quakers call it, is not only absence of noise. Gathered worship springs from the reverent, silent expectation that God will come among the people. The silence deepens as we feel ourselves drawn beautifully to God and each other our hearts and souls burst with thanksgiving, a thanksgiving best expressed by silence. This in this morning's text, all of Elijah's senses were assaulted. First with a wind strong enough to split rocks, then with an earthquake, and finally with the blazing flames of a fire. But God was nowhere to be found. And so Elijah waited until he finally encountered God in the silence. I'm not good at silently waiting on God as Elijah did in days of old and as the society of friends sometimes known as Quakers do today. It's not that I have no interest in a divine encounter I'm just not good at waiting for it. Some of you may understand what I'm talking about. You see, I've grown accustomed to the narrative that goes on in my head all day long. A narrative that reviews what's happened in the past and one that anticipates or dreads what will take place in the future. On rare occasion, the narrative finds itself in the present, taking the form of an ongoing commentary best described as criticism or praise or jealousy or attraction of one thing or another. 
And if I get tired of my own narrative, I take a break from it most often by cracking open a novel from the library. You may do it with music or a television series or a documentary or a concert or a, or a movie. In each case, we are simply substituting our own inner noise for outer noise. Our minds are constantly running 24 hours a day, even within our dreams. And we wonder why we're so exhausted. No, it's not the heat. It's the constant chatter going on within us. Chatter that prevents us from any kind of encounter with God. But when it has become too much for me, usually after I have embarrassed myself by losing my temper and saying something I will soon be apologizing for, I once again hear the words of Jesus saying, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Because after all, that's what I'm looking for, rest. Rest from the relentless schedule of my day. Rest from the voices of self-criticism. Rest from the news headlines that have nothing good to offer. Rest from the discontent that has dug its way deep into my soul like a tick that burrows beneath the skin. I'm looking for rest. And within the next 45 seconds, if possible, because I've got a deadline to meet. I've been told that a good way of spending time with God in silence is to find a comfortable place to sit maybe a spot on the sofa and then get a chair and place it next to you and once you've settled yourself you invite God to join you and you imagine God sitting in the empty chair and you just sit with each other without the need to say anything you're not there to offer God praise and you're not you don't start in on your list of wants and needs you just sit with each other, sort of like you might sit silently on a park bench with a friend, both of you looking out at the glory of nature. And God might have a word or two to share with you, but most of the time that won't be the case. Most of the time, you just sit there. And after five minutes, or 20 minutes, or half an hour, giving yourself grace for however long it may take to silence the inner noise your mind keeps returning to. You spend some time with God and then return to your routine. And I've been told that if I turn this into a daily routine, expecting God to show up without expecting to hear anything from God, then I will eventually come to know peace and rest and a sense of happiness that I didn't know before. But I get bored with routines. And before I know it, I've re-engaged with the ongoing interior chatter that will eventually leave me once again exhausted. I call it boredom but in truth, I might be on the brink of hearing a word from God that I'm not prepared to hear. And so instead, I break away from the silence. I suspect Elijah wasn't prepared for what he heard from God in the silence. You see, Elijah was on the run. And after pitting God's power against the power of Queen Jezebel's pagan god Baal, in a theatrical competition similar to the anticipated cage fight between Musk and Zuckerberg, having won the competition, Elijah had all of Jezebel's prophets put to death, something that didn't set well with her. So Elijah made a quick exit into the desert, running toward this mountain, this morning's mountain. 
And when God finally spoke to him out of the silence, it was to tell him to go back to where he had come from. And not only that, but to anoint Elisha to take his place as prophet. It seems that it was time for Elijah to retire. I suspect this is not what Elijah had been hoping to hear from God. I'm betting he was instead hoping for an attaboy pat on his back. God is present in the silence. That's a fact. And we can find comfort in that. We can sense God in that silence by routinely shutting off the noisy chatter within our heads. When we do, we will eventually know peace. We don't need to hear a word from God as evidence of God's presence. But if we're looking for a word from God, beware that it might not be the word we were hoping to hear. It may be to, re to leave a relationship or a job. It may be to resolve our differences with an enemy. Or it may simply be all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of thing shall be well. If you're looking for God, you may indeed experience God in the techno wizardry of postmodern church worship. But if there is still an emptiness within you, you might try looking for God in the silence, a silence that leads to peace and rest and happiness. Amen.